Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Konstantinos Komaitis. Konstantinos is a veteran in developing and analyzing internet policy to ensure an open and global internet. He spent almost 10 years in active policy and strategy development as a senior director at the Internet Society. Before that, he spent seven years as a senior lecturer at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, where he was researching and teaching internet policy. Konstantinos is a public speaker, having talked at many events around the world, including a TEDx talk. He is also the author of a book on domain name regulation and a writer for a variety of outlets, such as Politico, Brookings, Slate, TechDirt, and Euractive. Finally, he is the co-host with Gillian York of the Internet of Humans podcast. So, Konstantinos, you know about our 3 plus 1 format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment. Let me put the first question up. So, how do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telecom operators? Well, first of all, hi, Caroline. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's um, great to be here and to speak on that topic. And here's the thing about this whole conversation. Um, I feel that there are some misunderstandings. Um, and that is based on also the question that you've just asked me. So the first misunderstanding, I would say, is this belief or even the promotion of the idea that the Internet operates like the telephone network. Uh, and this is a bad analogy. Worse, it can be a dangerous analogy. And it's not that we have not heard it before. Uh, in fact, we have been hearing it for the past couple of decades. The internet, however, and I cannot stress this enough, is very different from uh, the telephone network. And it continues to amaze me how in 2022 we still need to clarify this. The second misunderstanding is the belief that it is content that drives traffic. That is actually not the case. Broadband customers are causing traffic, not content. This is a fact, and we can spin it any way we want, but without content, at the end of the day, there are no customers, and thus there is no traffic. And the last misunderstanding is that transit traffic is still responsible for most connections. Uh, transit traffic has a tendency to be expensive, and of course, this is where some of those arguments now start resonating and explain this, this relationship that needs to be uh, rethought between telecom operators and platforms. However, um, according to recent studies, we are seeing that this is really not the case as well, and there is a major shift from transit to peering traffic. And if you don't mind, I would like to take a couple of moments here, a couple of minutes, to, to just go a little bit deeper on that, because it really goes back to the first point, how the internet is very different from um, the, a telephone network. So telecom operators are absolutely correct when they are stating that internet traffic has increased over the years. What they fail to mention, I feel, is the fact that because of that, they had to become more and more creative. And the internet has allowed them to do that. So what's happening right now? So as ISPs deal with volumes of traffic, um, it is more efficient for them to start creating direct peering connections rather than sending uh, the traffic up their transit providers. Uh, and the advantage that peering has is that it decreases the load as well as the cost of the transit service and leads to better performance. So in this increasing complexity, and in order to survive this increasing complexity, ISPs are constantly involved in substantial amounts of traffic engineering. Essentially, these are management decisions that allow them to allocate traffic to the different paths that they control. Those traffic engineering techniques are generally used to keep traffic ratios, appearing uh, traffic ratios, sorry, within balance and for cost efficiency. Mm -hmm. And this all that thing is a direct outcome of the meshing of the internet, and it is what has provided really, um, uh, what has allowed, better yet, telecom operators the, the ability to enter into those bilateral agreements on how to exchange traffic. So the, the reality is that 
uh, in today's internet, the vast majority of content uh, consumed by end users is available by peering the major content providers. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the issues and the relationships between actors uh, is much, are, are much more complex than what a payout scheme could possibly solve. Um, telecom operators feel that they deserve special treatment uh, and that comes from the old way of doing things under the telephone network. However, in the internet, that is really not the case because the internet we keep on repeating is a decentralized technology. It has no center of control. So there, no one can be more special than the other. And I would leave it at that. So very democratic way of defining the internet that no one can be more special than another. Um, and, and telcos who won't like hearing that, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I think the, the, the special factor, and, and you mentioned payout schemes in, in your answer, um, is, is probably what, what um, justifies my second question, which is what are the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested to pay for the network of telcos? I would say that the, there are three main ones, a technical one, a rights-based one, and an economic one. Um, so I'll start with the technical uh, danger. So the internet is much more than last mile connection, right? It is complex and we keep hearing that, but that's the truth. And it is an interdependent ecosystem. Uh, the underlying infrastructure of the internet, the bits that are not visible to the average user, but allow communications and data to flow amongst networks, uh, involves a lot of technical building blocks and also many different actors. Hmm. Telecom, telecom uh, networks are important parts of the internet ecosystem, but they are not the entirety of the internet ecosystem. In fact, I could argue, depending on how one sees it, the internet, that they're far from it. There is, a, there is a diverse ecosystem of different actors who, who contribute constantly to the building blocks of the current internet. So in the internet, once a network is connected, then it is accessible by anyone anywhere in the world, right? This is part of the whole idea when we say global internet. In order to do this, the network, a network only needs to find another network that it can negotiate how to interconnect with. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the most simple, low-cost arrangement, and it is what really has ensured this growth and innovation that we have been seeing and experiencing over the past couple of decades in particular. Now, what telecom operators are sort of suggesting is going to change this simple yet efficient arrangement. And it will oblige negotiations that are different, top down and regulated, um, that will oblige essentially platforms to negotiate how a lot of things before they can even exchange traffic. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing flips the idea of the global and open internet to its head it can also be the cause of great fragmentation. Now, in practice, this means that users will only be able to access services and content that has been agreed as part of this negotiation with telecom operators that we were talking about. And also the quality and conditions of this content will also be subject to whatever negotiation uh, has been agreed. So it is a really bad policy idea for Europe, as well as for the internet, to suggest legislation that seeks to regulate how IP networks are managed, to alter um, network architecture, um, or even to undermine how commercial arrangements between network operators uh, should be undertaken. Instead, I think that, and this is where the commission, I feel, should continue to focus on because it really knows what it's talking about when it focuses on those things, is create predictable and proportionate solutions that can enable growth. And we know this, right? Competitive markets, liberalization, reliance on open standards, support for the free, free flow of information. And of course, all that needs to be done under the multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue. My second point is, the second danger, better yet, is right-based. And uh, sort of, you know, when I was thinking about that, um, I was like, here we are again. Let's talk about network neutrality. 
But it is really a conversation about network neutrality because the core thing about network neutrality is the, is the concern of how ISPs can serve as gatekeepers to the content that we users um, are paying to, to access. And considering that ISPs are the, literally the only pathway to our homes, they have tremendous power to determine what content I can access and on what terms. And in fact, here's a little detail that I don't think a lot of people appreciate. ISPs have also the monopoly on the terminating access line directly to users because users only subscribe to one ISP at a time. So from a technical perspective, ISPs can manipulate users' internet access in a number of different ways. They can block content, they can throttle users' access, or they can even allow prolonged periods of widespread congestion and drive users crazy. So imagine now an environment where telecom operators are able to negotiate deals for infrastructure development with certain companies within the internet's value chain. This could lead to the very likely scenario where telecom operator, operators end up prioritizing traffic or allowing content from certain companies. And there is also the possibility that this prioritization of services and content can become part of such deals. All these will not only provide an unfair advantage to certain telecom operators and, and platforms, right? But it, and it, it will further expand the power telecom operators have in the access market. Um, and of course, it is, goes completely against the existing open internet regulation and it will negatively affect the internet experience uh, in Europe. And finally, the third danger uh, is economic. Uh, there is a valid question, I believe, that the European Commission should uh, ask itself and provide an answer as to how sustainable uh, a model that is premised on big technology companies paying out you know, other companies, telcos in our case, is going to be in the long run. Um, I cannot think of any commercial reality that dictates technology companies will stand by and continue to pay for years and years and years for the infrastructure of someone else, especially when they themselves can lay down fiber and they can do all those things that uh, telcos providers are doing. Um, at the same time, can we... I think we need to be a little bit cognizant and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that this has not been brought up more um, have we considered the implications of providing such an unprecedented access to big tech, to Europe's infrastructure? I mean, for the past year, Europe has been talking a lot about cyber sovereignty and has been trying to identify ways, you know, to be able and, and express it uh, within the internet uh, reality. Um, part of this sovereignty or part of the way it has been interpreted is that we want to be more and more autonomous from those US companies. And right now we're inviting them within Europe's core infrastructure because they will be part of the infrastructure once they start negotiating um, those deals. So it all goes down to, I believe, what sort of an internet future the, the commission would like to foster. Is it one where future innovators have the opportunity to participate and contribute? Or is it one where a certain... Um, uh, a small number of commercial actors, whether it is big tech or telcos, uh, determine the way the evolution happens. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I think a couple of elements in, in, in your answer certainly resonated. One is the fact that so far on the internet, the nice thing was that users could pick the winners yeah. um, <laughs> and that these things shift uh, over time. I know that for a lot of people, big tech seem to be there forever but the internet has shown that forever is not really a concept that functions it's only for as long as users want to come to you um, and um, also i think the idea that bringing in the room or bringing in a room big tech and big telecoms to make deals between themselves with or without a regulator or with the input of a regulator at some point should indeed worry us knowing all the effort that um, the, the, the EU has been putting into trying to limit the gatekeeper position of big tech through the DMA, through the DSA. And then suddenly we seem to be giving them more power maybe in the future on, on our infrastructure. So I, I, I see your point there. 
And if I may just add one tiny thing, we have a little bit of a precedent here. We know that, you know, the, the Australian bargaining code, for instance, which is this negotiation between big tech and publishers for similar payout schemes for different reasons altogether, of course, on this one. But there have already been reporting that smaller publishers have been excluded from these deals. And all of these deals have been completely non-transparent because they are behind massive walls of non-NDAs. So we don't even know what's going down in these deals. We just know that there are lump sums exchanging hands and that's it. Where that money is going, how it's being utilized, whether it advances journalism, which was the essence mm -hmm. of those deals, we, we have no visibility. So again, Asking to exchange money, I don't think, is a sustainable solution, and it's really not workable, uh, especially in the long run. Well, that's going to disappoint the telcos. <laughs> um, let, let me switch to, to a third um, argument that's been brought into the, the debate, which is um, in terms of investment. And, and do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech and of telecoms operators in infrastructure as suggested by some, and obviously mostly by telecom operators. So I personally find this whole com discussion on contribution a little bit um, misguided, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps partly because I feel we are thinking of contribution infrastructure in extremely limited terms. Um, the internet infrastructure and the value chain that is really sitting on top of it uh, again, I will repeat it, has become super complex uh, over the years. And this, of course, is because of the continued innovation that has been happening and because there are so many um, um, actors and the number, of course, is increasing that are involved in that chain that each one has different roles and responsibilities and specificities within the, the, that ecosystem. Um, I think to have an informed conversation, it is important not only to recognize the interdependence of the market segments uh, within the internet infrastructure, uh, but also to accurately depict who puts what towards the internet economy. So I really, I'm not an economist, uh, uh, but one of the things that I know is that in general, value chain injection includes investments, and that is the, the, the financial capital, and then uh, an innovation, and that is the human capital, the, the human part of the capital. Uh, and both of these, of course, involves a lot of risk taking. Um, a lot of what has been contributed by platforms, uh, all right, uh, is the creation of new categories that did not exist prior, and a lot of those. Um, services have become part, have become somewhat uh, part of the infrastructure. Um, so much of the value that is extracted by digital platforms, platforms is in some way and can be continued as value creation rather than this idea of I am eating somebody else's lunch. Uh, so the reality is that each segment and each actor in the value chain invests in the internet ecosystem and pays its own cost um, of goods sold, right? Necessary to sustain and grow its segment. So every mail that we send, every video that we upload, every picture of a cat that we share depends really on data traffic that moves through international network infrastructure. And to ensure the sustainability and robustness of this international infrastructure, there are a host of different actors that include both global companies as well as local providers that continuously build and invest in this infrastructure uh, so people can continue to enjoy and have access to the internet even, or if you want, especially in times of pandemics, which, you know, again, four years ago, we never thought that we needed, but here we are, uh, you know, they happened. And as I keep on saying for the past three years, especially when it comes to the internet and COVID, you know, the, the internet was ready. Governments not so much about this pandemic um, because it really demonstrated its resilience and its robustness. Let me give you an example of perhaps of, you know, what I mean, which might resonate better with, with the audience. 
think of the way I was thinking about the the way cities operate, right? The more buildings get built, the more robust infrastructure needs to be in order to allow people to move around and get to where they need to go. If this does not happen, then congestion increases. And as people try to identify alternative ways to get to reach their destination. And this, of course, makes traffic worse. And all of us have been stuck in traffic and all of us we're not happy to be stuck in traffic. We're not enjoying this. So in order to avoid this, uh, service and content platforms invest and build additional services and new infrastructure to direct, process, and store the data necessary to allow users to access the internet in, in more effectively and faster and easier and all that stuff. So cloud, the cloud, I believe, um, is a very good example here. Um, because cloud providers, they have demonstrated throughout the years that there are major investors in many of the building blocks, um, like, for instance, you know, the hosting pillar. But they're also cont contributing sig significantly to the networking pillar. pillar. Um, they invest on first mile. Those are your data center networks. Mm -hmm. They invest on international transit. Those are your subsea cables. They invest in the middle mile. Those, those are the software-defined virtual wide area networks. And of course, they also invest on content delivery networks. So I feel that it is crucial we frame this question as one that seeks to understand the roles and responsibilities that its actor plays within the internet ecosystem, rather than one that is premised on you owe me and, they for you, and therefore you have to pay me. So complexity is certainly one of the keywords that came back, both in terms of um, understanding how the network functions and assessing how the value chain is, is put together and what all the different building blocks are. So now as a challenge, in, in, in the face of all of that complexity, is your soapbox moment. How, how are you going to translate that complexity into a simple message to the two strong women uh, in Brussels, uh, Roberta Metzola and Ursula von der Leyen, respectively presidents of the European Parliament and the European Commission. You have approximately two minutes to tell them what they should do, what they shouldn't do, what the internet wants from them, <laughs> and uh, how they can maybe do something that um, responds to the needs of you know, more broadband and all of that without... Um, uh, touching the fundamentals of how the internet functions? Europe has a choice to make. And I think that this choice will determine its role um, in, in the international arena when it comes to its, when it comes to its influence vis-a-vis -vis regulation, but also its ability to evolve and sustain a robust digital economy uh, within the region. Um, the choice is whether to have a user-centric internet or one that is driven by a small number of actors, again, be it big tech or telcos. Europe has been telling us that it is the former, but unfortunately, uh, discussions and initiatives like this, um, like this one, point to the latter. Um, it is important to understand and see the internet economy as a market success and a key economic driver, not a market failure that needs uh, regulatory intervention. And it is equally important for the Commission and Europe in general not to confuse size with success. I would really urge the European Commission to try to understand the real reasons uh, for the situation of the converged um, European telco sector and why we are at a place where we are right now. Is it the cost of regulation? Is it the strict merger policy, perhaps, in the EU telecoms area? Is it a lack of innovation uh, mindedness from telcos operators? Or is there an effective market failure problem and can we actually prove that? But ultimately, uh, the, the main question that I would love um, the Commission and Europe to answer when it comes to this specific issue is why does Europe really want to go backwards? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't frame it that way, Constantinos. <laughs> I'm sure, but we are. But that is the thing, right? I mean, we have a 2015 in open internet regulation that we all worked very hard. It was 
it came right after a similar debate, if you remember, back in 2012, when Wicked was taking place, ETNO, which is, you know, the European Telecoms uh, Network Association, just, you know, came together and the sender party pays proposal was again on the table, more international. It was rejected left, right and center, if you remember, back in the day. Then it was broke, brought sorry, into Europe and we had an extensive discussion. And in 2015, Europe really became one of those steady and, and um, stable uh, supporters of the idea that we should not prioritize traffic, we should not mess up with traffic, we should ensure that users are able to access the traffic as they intended to, which is reflective of how the internet architecture works. And those discussions were long, they were painful, the, you know, a lot of resources were spent. And I am, the reason that I'm asking the question why we're going backwards is because it feels like that. It feels like we are, you know, we are disregarding those conversations, we're disregarding all the time that people spend, all the resources that people spend. And I'm talking about volunteer time, I'm not talking about the resources that big technology companies or big telcos have spent. I'm talking about users participating in this exercise and six years down the road we have a new uh, seven years what it is we have a new commission that is willing to reopen the same debate and have the same conversation when there is no evidence that we actually need this conversation anymore so that is why i feel we're going backwards i'm sure that other people will not see it like this I actually believe that in many, many instances, Europe has been moving forwards and it has making strides. I think the, the, you know, the DSA package is a remarkable achievement. And of course, there is still a lot of work to be done. But actually agreeing on a text, you know, for such a massive <laughs> file, that is, that is remarkable. So I am, I'm getting frustrated a little bit when I'm seeing those, those wins and those achievements being diluted, or if you want, overshadowed by bad policy. Well, well, let's hope that um, th this will just be a discussion and and probably not result in policy. Um, there's there's talks about consultation coming in the fall. Um, I'm sure we will see then what shape it takes. And who knows, maybe we have a follow-up podcast <laughs> once we know what the questions are of that consultation and the scope to see if they uh, did identify an area of market failure or if, as we expect, um, this might be just a lot of pressure and uh, a reaction to that pressure. Um, and in terms of re having the same conversations, some of us cynics in Brussels would say that's job security <laughs> to a certain extent. <laughs> that, that is a very good way of thinking of things, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Constantinos, for your time. And um, I, I, I would hope this conversation to be the beginning and the end of it, but I'm expecting it to have a follow-up probably uh, in the fall. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me.